We welcome you back to our class. We will not meet next Monday. Okay. We'll take the 4th of July off. Celebrate the nation and do what you want to do, but we'll not have class next Monday. And then for those of you who are also in Wednesday night class, next Wednesday will be a potluck. So we won't meet. Oh, we're going to do the potluck then? Sure. Well, we'll, we'll I didn't know what else Saturday, Sunday, the 5th Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, we'll still do that. And because most of us won't be here Saturday, but we'll do a potluck on Wednesday. So we won't meet Monday or Wednesday next week. We'll meet Tuesday, though. We will meet Tuesday. Okay. And we'll meet Tuesday at the afternoon. Yeah, 4.30. 4.30. So, always something going on that we can get together with to encourage each other. Yay. Let's pray. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the blessings you give us. God, I pray that you would be with us in our class this evening. Let your spirit guide us in our discussion to the conclusions we draw, the things we learn, so that we can know more about your word, so we can be the people you call us to be. Father, I thank you for caring for us the way that you do. Be with Calvis and Chi Chi as they both got COVID now. And we just pray that you look out for them and give them a easy dose of that so that they're able to get up and around pretty soon and be with Kyle as he's continuing to recover from his hip surgery and we pray God that he gets a good report on Thursday from the doctor. Be with all of us Father as we try to be the people you call us to be. Help us to trust you. Help us to know that you care about us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Well, we are finishing Luke chapter 14. We're doing parables, and Luke came along and gave us a bunch of parables all together. So we're in the midst of a long litany of parables. In the last few weeks, we covered where Jesus was at a home, and the Pharisees were challenging him and didn't like what he had to say, and he taught about humility. And then he covers what I believe is basically a reference to the Jewish people, which was, you got called to the feast, you didn't come. He said, now we've gone out in the highways and the byways and just invited everybody to show up. Uh, I think a precursor of the idea that Gentiles would be welcomed into the church as well. And so we, we pick up right there with the next parable. Okay. I don't think he's still in the same house. I think he's moved, he's left. Now, here's what his parable says. Suppose one of you wants to build a building. Won't you just sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? But if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is a tough story. It's a tough thing that I'm afraid we don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about. So what's the parable mean? What's he saying? Jesus didn't want a, a driver and a father did not want a, a blind or naive uh, uh, commitment. Okay. He wants us coming to him knowing what we're getting into. All right. What else? Is that the best answer you're going to get? It's a good answer. And I think that gets it. Remember, I think the idea certainly is we need to calculate the cost of following Jesus. And I've got a funny feeling, only from my own experiences, that a lot of people come to Jesus with no idea what it means they're going to have to give up or what they're going to get for it or how it's going to be challenging to them. They just accept what some preacher says or what mom and dad says or somebody else says, and they think, well, that sounds good to me. I think I'd like to do that. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. So I'm going to accept Jesus as my Savior. I think Jesus is saved. I want a little bit more thought in it than that. And if we go ahead, Ross. But if if you're if you're stepping out in faith, mm -hmm. 
you don't have a clue what you're getting into, but you just feel called to step out in faith. And I think that's true. And so you can't calculate what you don't know. You can't calculate what you don't know, but if we're doing our job, I think, teaching correctly, which I submit I haven't done a good job of doing at times, we tell people, should be telling people, if you're going to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can no longer live with your girlfriend. You know, you got to either get separate bedrooms or get married or do something because that's not the way God wants you to live. Or whatever they may be doing that isn't Christ-like, and I'm not saying we change overnight necessarily and suddenly we don't have any temptations or problems or anything. But if somebody wants to come to Jesus and says, I want to come to Jesus, I want to go to heaven, I want my sins forgiven. I think Jesus wants us to tell them, okay, but the sins you're committing now, you need to be willing to give up. You need to be willing to let go. And I suspect many of us think, and I'm just again speaking for myself out of this thing, I'm not a bad person. You know, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not a bad person. I don't murder people. I'm not doing all these horrible, nasty things that nasty people do. And so all I've got to do is say, okay, Jesus. And basically, I just keep living the way I'm living. I just accept Christ as my Savior and say, I'll take that. And I think Jesus is saying in these two little stories, it's got to be more than that. And I think not more than that in the sense that we earn our salvation or anything like that at all. But the idea of what am I getting into? What am I signing up for? Well, it's, many times we get in the problem, and, and we've all probably used this word, I didn't sign up for that. You know, I, I didn't expect that to be part of the deal. And I think we don't, I think we do a disservice to some people by not letting them know, especially if they weren't raised in church. Quote, unquote, raised in church. If you're raised in church, you've probably got a pretty good idea of things you're not supposed to be doing what you should be doing, because you've heard hundreds of sermons, you've been in Bible classes, you've had people, mom and dad or whoever, uh, tell you don't do those things, good people don't do this kind of stuff. But if they're just coming to Christ out of the world, many of those people, I think, have no idea what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And all they like to hear is, you get your sins forgiven and go to heaven. And I think Jesus is saying in these two stories, you better be thinking about what does it mean to follow Jesus. And I'm not sure we do enough of that. I'm not even sure we do enough of that now with us in church, in our sermons, challenging people. Again, we're not earning our salvation. We're not working our way to salvation. But I think we need to be taught. If you're a child of God, there's things you don't do. And if you're a child of God, there are things you should be doing. And maybe we, we give a lot of Easy grace where nobody's expected to do anything. Does that make sense? No, oh, it's more speaking. Is salvation an event or a process? Yes. And I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. It's both. There's a moment where you're saved. Whatever that moment is, there's a moment when you're saved. But then there's a process to continue living with Christ. I think that's why Paul writes, you know, I buffet my body daily. I like to say I Made my body daily. Eat and the worst thing. Now that's why I, mean, I buffet my body daily, lest after I've done all this work and saved all you people, I don't make it. And I think he saw it as a process that it's something we work toward. It isn't a one-time thought of I'm saved now. That's it. That isn't what Jesus teaches. That's not what Paul teaches. Yeah, I think because I, I'm just with a lot of the mega churches and what they're teaching that we just gotta love everybody, you know, just you don't have to be who you wanna be, you know, just whatever. So I think in today's age with homosexuals and, and whatnot, I don't think they think it's a big deal for like a boyfriend and girlfriend to move in together and stuff like that. Even though they say they're Christians, which they can be mm -hmm. um so I think they're picking and choosing the lesser of the, you know what I'm saying? I mean, well, at least I'm not homosexual, but I'm just and playing I, with my I boyfriend. I think we do that too, though. You know, because it's not, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to marry him, you know, so it's not like I'm sleeping around, I'm, I'm sleeping. So I think people, it's like back then, you, you know, you had 
you did have homosexuals, you know, all the guys and stuff. But you didn't have what we have today with the media and stuff like that. So I think with the mega churches and what they're teaching the people, they're believing that. But I think it doesn't just have to be mega churches. It doesn't have to be. I think if we're not careful, we can give that message to ourselves of as long as you're not really doing anything nasty, and uh, it's okay to be whoever you are. You know, we're not going to jump on you if you're gossiping. We're not going to jump on you if you tell some lies once in a while. We're not going to be too concerned about your lifestyle if you go out and get drunk no more than three times a week. As long as you're contributing. As long as it's like three times. Three times, yeah, yeah. Whatever the rule is we're going to make. I think we do that in our own lives. I think sometimes I look at my life and think, you know, all in all, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't do all those horrible, nasty things that the Bible says I'm not supposed to do until I read the second part of Colossians 3 that says get rid of all the anger and malice and gossip and all those other mm -hmm. things that are almost human nature. I hate to say it that way, but they are. Mm -hmm. And I think Jesus is saying we need to sometimes think about what does God ask of me? Besides just saying, I believe. Yes. I, I don't have a lot of experience. I didn't grow up in the church. I'm one of those people who came out of the okay. world and the church. Me too. And um, my, um, my thought, I mean, I, I stepped out in faith. Uh, a little bit, um, <laughs> enough information to make me dangerous, I guess. <laughs> um, but, but it's a process. It's been a process. It is a process. Um, and I, I think if you're really going to follow Jesus, it, knowing you had to give up this or that or the other, I think he's making me into the person he wants me to be. Why do and, that? Completely? And so Absolutely. if I had known, if I sat down, you know, like this morning I was calculating the cost of a pergola, blah, 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 I'm thinking, okay, if I'd done that here, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't have it. known what to calculate. I well, and calculate. I agree with you, Roslyn, in the sense that many of us, Again, if you weren't raised in church, and I admire people who weren't raised in church who come to Jesus, because their path is a whole lot different from mine. You know, I was raised in church. My grandpa, my grandma went to church. I mean, everybody in my generation that I know of have been church people. And so my experiences are different than yours and those. And I can appreciate the fact that it's strange. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's, it's a different lifestyle to say I'm coming out of this worldly lifestyle, coming into church. What does that mean? And I think we're all different. And I do completely agree. It's a process. God's molding us into the people he wants us to be. And the song that says, just as I am, that is the way God wants us. He doesn't expect us all to get fixed first. He expects us to just come to him. calculated all it. Then you think, oh my gosh, if I better just check the list off here but I think uh, before I say anything. Yeah, I don't think it's checking lists. And I don't think it's, you've got to get it all fixed ahead of time. But I think there's a lot of Christians who believe they're Christians, but decided this isn't costing me anything. I somewhere said the words that I believe in Jesus, and I'm just living the way I want to live. And isn't that a little bit like the seed that falls on this ground that doesn't really take root? Yeah, they get killed off. Yeah, I think there is some of that. And that's why, and maybe it's hard to do in, in the circumstance you're talking about, what am I calculating? And I think that depends on who's teaching you. Because I think some person might come to you, teaching you, and let's say you're Greeky buddies. This one person finds Jesus and says, you know, if we're going to be true to Christ, we need to stop going to the bars every night. We need to stop sleeping around. We need to do whatever God wants us to do. And it is a process. You don't automatically lose your desire for alcohol just because you become a Christian. I think some people can, but most people don't. You don't automatically stop sinning just because you're a Christian. But I think somewhere along the way, and maybe it's part of that process and it's the maturing of Christianity, we do, I think, occasionally need to sit down and think, how am I doing? How am I measuring up to what God wants me to be? Again, not that I'm earning my salvation, not that I'm working hard to keep my salvation even. It's, if I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, what does that look like? What does he call me to do? I think it may be 
some of the changing, some of the calculating comes after you've already accepted him and you're looking at your life or people you're going to Bible class or you're studying the Bible and you're reading in there, you know, Jesus says I shouldn't be doing this. Paul writes about all this list of stuff I shouldn't be doing. I need to look at my life and see, you know, can I get rid of those things? Can I get God to shape me into the person he wants me to be? I agree with that. We, we're moving a day at a time. And hopefully the goal is in the right direction. And John and I talk sometimes. And I think Christianity is a an aim. I want to be better. I want to be moving forward. Even though some days I'm off the path and I'm over here in the ditch. But my ultimate destination, that's what I would, my ultimate movement is positive. It should be to be like Jesus. That's right. Somewhere along the way I'm moving closer to God than I was two or three years ago. Realize that some days I'm in a ditch. Some days I'm not doing what God wants me to do. Some days my faith isn't as strong as I wish it was. But my pathway is forward. And I think that's why Christians need to learn Romans 8.1 that says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say it like you mean it. <laughs> say it. Somebody else, what does it say? Romans 8 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, the fact you sin occasionally doesn't make God condemn you. Doesn't make God say, Oh, you sinned today, you're done. You know, I've only given you 2,000 sins in your lifetime. When you hit 2001, it's over. God doesn't do that to us. As long as our desire, is that profession of faith. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to be saved. I want to live with him forever. I want him to forgive me of my sins. I want him to mold me into the person he wants me to be. I think as long as you keep that thought, even though it may wane and wax and wane from time to time, you're okay with God because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's something many, many Christians have never learned. And they hate themselves. And they feel miserable because they're thinking, i got to pay for that sin I did last week. You know, God doesn't like me anymore. God loves us, period. And he knows us. Well how, to how, like if you break a law, and the law is eating every day, every time you get behind the wheel. Right. Mo? Mo? <laughs> is this you, Mo? I'm just saying. Oh, okay. I, 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 I understand what you're saying because... Obviously, again, it's it's not a major, but it does say in here, no big, no, it doesn't matter how big or how small. Yeah, there's no big or small. That's right. Sin is sin is sin. But is that true? Is that feeding? Is 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 that a sin because you're breaking the law as well? Or I think so. If you know what you're supposed to do, take your foot off, girl. You know, and I'll confess, I used to drive like a mad hornet. I used to be able to find like a map what? Hornet. 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 I used to <laughs> scream down the highway. And my salvation was I knew every cop in Yuma County. I knew all the highway patrolmen in Yuma County. As long as I could get across the Yuma County line, I could hammer down and go ninety miles an hour down the freeway with well, in Arizona, who cares anyway? Well, <laughs> that was, that was my thought, right? I'm not gonna run into anything except the coyote or something. Right. There. But somewhere along the way, and I don't remember who I was talking to, but somebody, it might have been the time I came back from Vegas, you know, and was dragging about. It's normally a what, five and a half hour drive know. from Yuma to Vegas. I got home in a little under two hours. Home oh, because it was New Year's Eve. Were you in one day? No, no, no. no. I, was, I wouldn't have done that if somebody had been in the car with me. But it was New Year's Eve, and we have a special New Year's lunch, and we were all at a Christian youth seminar, youth yeah. rally. In Las Vegas. <laughs> and I needed to get home so I could get the pot roast on and the cornbread made and all that stuff. I couldn't wait till in the morning to leave. So, one o'clock in the morning, I took off for you and hammered down and off I went. You were really pushing it on your guardian angel. I really was. <laughs> I mean, it's pitch black. There are no lights in the middle of Arizona. But somebody, I think, when I was telling that story, raised the question Oh, you, you say that like you're bragging. Well, that's pretty cool. I must say that. Not most people can do that. You're a child of God. 
there's nothing really bragging about breaking the law. And I won't say I never speed anymore because I do, but I don't speed like I used to. I put the cruise control on. If I'm going from Jonesboro to Johnson City on 1180, cruise control is on 45 until I hit 40, and then it comes down to 40. But I have a tendency to speed. I don't see any reason not to. Except <laughs> the law says no. no I know. I mean, I that's the key. I'm if I'm going to try to be what God wants me to be, then even the laws I don't agree with, I need to try to honor them. And I don't think I was lost, would have gone to hell just because I sped a lot many years ago. But I'm not being the man God wants me to be. I'm not living the example of honoring the law, doing what the government says. I mean, that law wasn't going to violate Christian principles by keeping the speed limit. And it's just, I think sometimes we do that. We we make those judgment calls. This isn't a big sin. Who really cares? And I know that's the problem. And I know what that book says. Sin is a sin. sin, is a sin. Uh, and I think that's the goal that we're talking about. Of, it's a process. It's calculating as we move on. Let's recalculate and see where in my life is going to need to get fixed. And I think that's the neat thing about Christianity. God gives us that time to get trust. He allows us his grace to work on us. His Holy Spirit's working on us. And the fact that I screw it up from time to time doesn't mean God throws me away and says, I don't want you. He always wants me. Another reason that the law says is because Satan never relents. He never quits. He's always going to tempt yes. us. The church is happy hunting ground. Can be, yeah. Because he knows if he can take a supposed strong Christian person and make them do sinful things, not only is it hurting you, it's hurting the people in your church. It's the people who look up to you as a godly man. And they're thinking, what heck if Don can do that? What's wrong with me doing that? And if Don can do that, then I can do this. Because this is no worse than that. And yeah, God doesn't want us to. He wants to be good examples. He wants us to be the kind of people that other people look at and say, you know, that's my idea of what a Christian man or a Christian woman looks like. Boy, I wish I could be that. The incurable that we don't put them up on a pedestal somewhere and say that's the epitome of Christianity. But I do think we're supposed to be good examples. And we should be the kind of people that others can look at and say, you know, that's the kind of attitude I'd like to have in the midst of trial. I want to be like Noah and just be able to just let that just go and by without getting all upset and angry and just move on. Well, that's the dumbest personality that God has given people too, because some people go to church, but they don't really deal with people. And so, as a result of that, they may be, you know, go to church and be, you know, might be unsinful, except the fact that they don't associate with other people in the church and so on. Well, there's Those extroverts people. and introverts and all these other words, and we do have different personalities. And I don't think we all have to be the same. If we were all the same, we wouldn't need each other. You know, one person could do it all. And some people are extremely introverted. I've shared enough in here to know I, I'd be just as happy to spend all day long reading a book. I don't care if I never talk to you guys again, because I love reading, and yeah, I'm just as too. happy. <laughs> I'm just as happy sitting there reading a book as I am conversing with anybody else. But God drug me out of that and said, "If you're going to be a preacher, you got to get along with people. You got to talk to them, and go out with them, and do things together." And so I do, but I'm not comfortable necessarily doing it. I, I'm much more comfortable sitting at home reading a book than I am. Well, you know, when you start following Jesus, you we come into a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And there's expectations in every relationship. And there's got expectations of me, and I have expectations of her. So that's kind of the, seeing what the cost is. What does Jesus expect of a follower? And we need to know that up front, or the rest the relationship may not work on on our side if we're not willing to do what he wants us to do. And I think, yes, but I hear what Rosalind is saying, too. Sometimes you don't even know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah, I agree. You don't know what you're because you weren't yeah. raised in church, so you don't know what it means to be a Christian. Or maybe you watch the wrong kinds of Christians, and you think that's what it means to be a Christian, and you get to be a Christian, and think, uh, that's not right. That's not the kind of person I want to be. But I do think it's an ongoing calculation that somewhere along the way we get enough faith in us, we've lived with God long enough to say, you know, I've read the Bible, 
And some of these things I'm doing, I'm not sure I should be doing them. And if I'm going to be true to God, and I think John's analogy is correct, it's a relationship. If you're married, you've got a spouse, or you've got kids, or you've got co-workers, or whatever, every relationship does have some kind of expectations that makes the relationship work. You know, if you get married and think, well, I'm married, but I've still got three girlfriends over here, and, you know, I'm going to take all my vacations by myself, and, and I'm just going to do what I want to do, and Debbie's primary job is to, you know, clean the house and have supper ready when I get home. You know, and if that's my, the way I'm doing things, she and I are probably not going to last very long. And I think that's true in any relationship. You've got a coworker. Maybe you've got one that doesn't do their job. You know, the expectation is you put in the same number of hours I do. Do your job. And they don't. You don't like that relationship. And it bothers you. And you're thinking, dang, I wish that person would get fired or something, fall off a horse or whatever. Because they're not fulfilling the expectations. Now, the neat thing, again, is God does have some expectations of us. He expects us, when we accept Christ as our Savior, that we read the book and try to live what it says. And I think those calculating times come regularly for us. Paul says, I think it's Paul, he says, examine yourself and see whether or not you're in the faith. In other words, we need to sit down once in a while and look at our lives and say, how am I measuring up as a child of God? How am I letting the Holy Spirit work on me? Not as a critical thing, not as a condemning thing, but as a desire to be in a better relationship with Jesus. I'm doing what it wants me to do. Well, you want to say something else? No, that was like a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a checkup, like you go to the doctor, see how you are healthy. How do you do that once in a while? How are you spiritually healthy yeah. periodically through your life? Yeah. Most of us, especially us men, we're very obvious. Maybe. You know, you got to be almost <laughs> dead to go to the doctor. Uh, we don't do well well checks. You know, but you got a little baby to do. You know, a little baby goes six months, nine months, year. You've got all these little measurements, and it's a checkup. Is my baby thriving? Is where's my baby at in the growth rate of normal kids? We do that all the time with little kids. I think there's a room for that in our Christianity. We start out as babies. I don't care if you've been in church your whole life. You still start out as an infant in God's kingdom. And the goal is let's grow. And the measuring stick is, number one, the Holy Spirit. Because he will help you and convict you and nudge you. But the other is the Bible. To see how am I doing with God. I think most point a while ago is a good one. Many of us have decided we'll make up our own rules. We don't like that rule, so we're just going to blow that one off. But we'll keep these others because I don't do them. Those are not part of this. Those are not problems. Yeah, but we'll do this one, this one, this one. I don't have a problem with that. But the one I do mostly, well, I don't agree with that rule. We're just going to go get that rule. I don't think we get to do that. And I think somewhere along the way, if that's our attitude, we've got a serious problem. Because if Jesus is going to be king of our life, Lord of our life, understanding what that meant in the first century, that the king got to tell you what to do. And you didn't get to say, I don't want to do that. Saying that got your head locked off. You know, or you got thrown in prison. Fortunately, God didn't do that to us. But the idea is he's king. He makes the rules. I don't get to make the rules. And somewhere along the way, the Hebrew writer talks about if you continue to walk unworthy, you continue to go your own way, ultimately God hardens your heart. You decide, I don't want God at all. And I think then you walk away. Several passages in Paul's writing says, and God gave them up. I think ultimately God says, you don't want me. You don't want to live the way I want you to live. Your choice. He wants everybody. He wants to save everybody. He doesn't make any of us do what he wants us to do. He doesn't make any of us be saved. And I think the, the cost setting or the cost evaluation, and I'm glad Ros, you, you mentioned that because I do agree, it's a process too. And I'm hoping that as I look at my own life, I can look at my life and say, you know, I'm not the same that I was 10 years ago. I'm a better, hopefully, teacher. Hopefully I'm a better Christian. Hopefully I'm a better friend. I'd like to hope I'm a better husband, but I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> you know, but I'd like to be able to measure myself and see, where am I? And where do I need to go? Where are some areas in my life that God still needs to work on? And give God permission 
to work on those. That's a scary thing to do. You ever sit and look at God and say, God, I've got a problem with gossip. I give you permission to do whatever necessary to make me stop gossip. You ever prayed anything like that? Mm-hmm. Well, God, my, my problem is drinking. I give you permission to do whatever is necessary to help me stop drinking. And when you mean that, you better be ready. Because you've got an alcohol problem, you make it a DUI ticket. That's when I quit smoking. Yeah. I remember that. Because I'd lied to everybody in the, in the life group we had in our house. Mm-hmm. And I remember confessing it to everybody there that night, praying about it. And the next morning I woke up and I had not had or wanted to have another incident. And I can remember that just vividly like yeah. yesterday. Yeah. She'd go by the bowling alley on the way home. Because in those days you could smoke in a bowling alley. Oh, bowling yeah. alleys were nothing but chimneys. Right. And she would come home smelling like smoke. Say, oh yeah, I stopped by the bowling alley and talked so and so and so and so. So we wouldn't know she was smoking. <laughs> she figured out a way to get around it. Yeah. And when and she was the, the board of directors, yeah, so she had a good reason to go by the bowling alley. But that's the kind of thing I think you know, when we look at our life and think, I need to not be doing this. That we go to God and say, God, you got to help me not do this. That we need to be ready for potentially some pretty bumpy road to get us where we're going. Well, I also think you'll have Satan come in and entice you oh, even sure. more sure he will. because you're trying to change for the better, and he does, he's not wanting you to do that. Yeah, Satan's always there. He never yeah. wants us to get closer to God. He always mm-hmm. wants us going the other direction. Paul, you know, when the Bible was written or even earlier time period, you look at think about people in the rural areas, they did not. Had trouble with them to find help. They had problems or trouble with them to find help. You know, exactly the is in when the Bible's written. So many people who live in rural areas, they may be a day to two days away from the town. They couldn't so if you're on a farm, you can't you know, couldn't leave for a day or two days because you just want to get all the, yeah. the work and so sure. on and you know, else can do it for you yeah. kind of thing. It's, it's, it's more problem those days. I mean now we get more evil comes at us, you know, it's like the devil you know, puts more things on the line and stuff like that, but it's still you can reach people. Certainly, there's, there's a whole lot better communication today and rapid travel than there was in the days of Jesus, that's certainly true. Which makes it, to me, interesting that the crowds followed Jesus from place to place. Who was taking care of their farms? <laughs> Who was taking care of their kids? Who was taking care of whatever? They wanted to be with Jesus. And again, I don't have a clue. Maybe they had some worker or somebody back home, wife stayed home, husband stayed home. I don't know. But many crowds followed Jesus wherever he was going because they wanted to be with him. And I think that's something we should pick up from the Gospels. We should want to follow Jesus, even though sometimes it's inconvenient. And I'm sure it was for them. There were no road rest stops along the way where these people would stop and go to the bathroom. You know, I don't know what they did. I don't want to think about what they did. But there weren't any places like we have today. You travel down the interstate, you can pull into the rest stop or the welcome room or whatever. And those people just started walking and off they went. It's like the 5,000 on the side of the sea. They've been with Jesus. They're up there. Jesus says they've been here all day. It's time to eat. Feed these people. Where are they going back? What happened to them? You know, again, their lives were totally different from ours. And they did things they needed to do because that's just what life was. But yeah, we have a whole lot easier life today as far as that stuff's concerned. But I like this any easier when it comes to following Jesus. Satan's working overtime still to try to drive people away from God, to try to make us get sidetracked, to make us think, well, my sins aren't so bad. I don't do what Mo does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm okay. And give us that false sense of righteousness. When in reality, I'm doing the same thing everybody else is doing. I'm just doing what I want to do and not doing what God wants to do. That's your next prayer. Your next thing you're dealing with is righteousness. <laughs> yeah, and notice, you know, what's the context of this parable? It's the verses before. And again, that's what we always do. We do the parable. What's the parable? Heck, what is it talking about? But what's the context? The context is large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He's left. The house of the Pharisees that we saw in the last three stories where he's been sitting there eating, telling those stories. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, 
anyone comes to me and does not hate mother and father, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Matthew 10 has a similar passage. It says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's a tough thing. And then he gives the parable we're looking at. Then he says, because who goes to build a building, who goes to fight a war, without calculating what's it going to cost me? And I think Jesus knew that statement's pretty tough. We still struggle with that. What do you mean i got to hate my mother and father? What do you mean i got to hate everybody else? What's Jesus talking about? What is Jesus talking about? What does that mean to you? How does he, how does he mean that? The love you have for him should be so powerful, so high, that it makes you look like you hate it's, your brothers and sisters. It's the cost mother. of following Jesus. It's, I mean, honestly, it's just, yeah, how when, they, when, the, when he told the fishermen, you know, come with me, and they just dropped everything and came with them, yeah. I mean, it's... They gave up their livelihood. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's the challenge, and I think that's why Jesus says this. And then he goes into these two parables. Some people, I think, believe following Jesus is a snap. All I got to do is say something, confess something, and I'm home free. Jesus is saying that's not the way it works. You're going to be expected to come after me first and foremost. And again, I think it's a learning curve. It isn't something that we automatically do. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes Christian fellowship. It takes prayer. It takes God's Spirit working on us, all that kind of stuff. But I think Jesus' point is, if you want to follow me, notice he's talking to these people who are following him. You may think it's nice following me right now because it's easy. But you need to be aware, you could lose your mother and father. And of course, we know there are Christians who, when they become Christians, their families disown them. You know, and whether they, they may be Catholics and they start going to a Protestant church, the Catholic church disowns them. They may be Muslims and turn to Christianity, and the Muslims are ready to kill them. I mean, they're, they don't talk to them, they throw them out of the house. That's what Jesus is talking about. Are you willing to give that up to follow me? And again, I don't. You may not even know that's the cost yet. Oh, no. No. I understand. No, I'm not saying you personally, but when you get ready to follow no, Jesus, you're right. no, you, don't. you may think, well, I'm going to run home and tell mom and dad I found Jesus, having no idea that dad's going to say, uh, you're out of here. You may have some stupid People have been convert in India to mm -hmm. Christianity. Um, they have to change their name. Yeah. Because they're persecuted. Yeah. You know, just two or three days ago, those three Iranians were put in jail for five years for nothing other than they accepted Jesus Christ. I think that's what Jesus is saying in these parables we're looking at. This is not going to be an easy, simple road. It's going to take some sacrifice on your part. You're going to have to toe the line, so to speak. And sometimes you're going to have to make a choice between mom and dad, your job, the people you live with, Whatever, because it's not going to be that easy necessary. So what's an idiom? Who's got an who's an English major in here? What's an idiom? You can be you can understand a, a standard word or an example. A what now? Say that again. You can, you can understand a word or an example. Okay, in a sense that's correct. An idiom is the use of a word that doesn't mean what it normally means. And it's a combination of words most of the time that changes the whole meaning of what the two or three individual words mean. I think that's what Jesus is doing here when he says you got to hate your mother and father. He isn't saying you got to hate because there's way too many passages that talk about you got to love people. You got to love your enemies. If you don't love people, you can't love God. So he's not saying you got to hate people. But I think John's right. In the relationship of who's number one in your life, it's got to be me, Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. It can't be me and mom. It can't be me and this guy. It can't be me and your job. It's got to be, I've got to be first. And again, we talked enough today about that comes and goes. 
you know, some days he's first. Some days we want him to be, but it just isn't. And because we let Satan drag us the wrong way for a minute, and we're just not as faithful today. But an idiom, as Paul says, it's the use of a word that's peculiar to itself, either in having a meaning that cannot be derived from the co-joined meanings of its elements. In other words, we read, I know that sounds horrible, and I don't like being an English teacher. <laughs> you got to hate your mother and father. That doesn't make any sense to us. What do you mean, hate your mother and father? But we say words like, well, that's up in the air. What's up in the air? Well, we're certainly all looking up above our heads. What's up in the air? No, that doesn't mean that. What does that mean? What's up in the air mean? Yeah, yeah, we don't know what the answer is going to be. It's got to be decided. But that's an example of what an idiom is. It's something's up in the air. It's neither up. It's not in the air. Um, another one is we give way. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not giving way. Why do you think I give way? I'm not giving anybody anything. It means we get out of the way. We move out of the way. Uh, I thought of some words. Think of some other idioms. Can you, what are some other idioms we use? And I know this is an English class, but I think sometimes we need to understand English to grasp what is Jesus doing here? Because I think we need to understand. He's not saying hate people. He's not saying be angry at others and want them to go to hell or whatever. He's making that comparison between what they stand in your life and what are I standing for. Anybody think of any? I'm going to give you some and you're going to say, oh, I know that, but I never knew it was an idiom. Because we didn't know what an idiom was, right? All right, here's some of them. You ever ride shotgun? Does that mean you put your leg over a barrel of a rifle or something and go walking down the road? You know? That doesn't mean that. What does that mean? I'm riding shotgun. We yell that all the time. We're well, not riding shotgun. We spill the beans. Now, some of us have done that once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but when we say I spill the beans, what do you say? I told you said something. Oh, I said it. something I shouldn't have said. I spilled the beans. What's up? The sky? Oh, yeah, whatever. It, what's happening? You know, what's going on? What, and, and we let's count out of the bag. And that's one heaven might like. <laughs> you know, that didn't mean I had a cat in a bag somewhere and let it loose. It means I told some secret. I let something out that I shouldn't have. Like the bullet. Anybody ever bit the bullet? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever literally bit the bullet. But we look at these things, I'm feeling under the weather. We all know what that means, right? You're not feeling very well. It doesn't have anything to do with whether the sun's shining or not. Uh, you ever had a knuckle sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody's about to punch you out or you're about to punch somebody else out. Uh, touch base? I'm going to touch base with you. Are we playing baseball now? I mean, what are you talking about touch base? And then the three items with make over, make up, and make out. You know, three totally different meanings but they all have to do with making something. Um, these are idioms. These are parts of English where the word makes sense if you take them by themselves, but if you run them together, they mean something totally, totally different. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here when he says, you gotta hate your mother and father in order to follow me. He's not literally meaning you gotta hate your mother and father. He's using that as a tense of English to say, as John did, in comparison between them and me, I gotta be first. And if I'm not first, I'm not there at all. Jesus will not take second place, or third, or fourth, or fifth. He wants to be first. And I think that's what the idea of these two parables is trying to cover. And so the question we all need to ask ourselves is, is Jesus first in my life? Is he first? foremost the thing I want to please is he the person that I want to be more like and again that comes and goes sometimes but the path needs to be I'm headed upward in the big scheme of things I'm better off up there than I am down here and while some days you know it's take three steps forward and two steps back as we say that happens but the general glide slope is I'm headed in the right direction I like getting in it's an idiot for life, so that's exactly right. No, three steps. What, three steps back? Three steps back? I'm not really moving anywhere. But we understand what that means, and I think that's true in our Christian walk with God. Some days we're not moving forward. Some days we're going back, and some days we're going back as fast as we can, not because we don't love God anymore, not because we don't know what to do. They just Satan got us, and we allowed our own selves to just get messed up. It's another idiot. Just 
life do we a curveball? There's another thing. And, yeah. and you know, we get we say those things all the time. God wants us doing what He wants us to do. He knows that if we do what He asks us to do, we've got a better life. That may sometimes not make any sense. But the ultimate goal is to be with Jesus, right? The ultimate goal is to spend eternity with God. That's the path we need to be on. God never promises us that life's going to be easy. That everything's going to work out just the way we want it to. In fact, he says in this life you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, he says. I've overcome the world. And I think that's what we need to look at. So the challenge is, do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind? And do I love my neighbor as myself? Am I wanting him to be first in my life? Am I willing to honestly tell him, God, I know I'm not perfect, but I want you to help me be. I want you to help me get over this problem I've got. I want you to help me love people more. I want you to help me encourage people more. I want you to help me whatever the blank is. It doesn't even have to be a bad thing. It may be a good thing you're doing that you just want to get better at. God, I need to be better at this. And we put God first. And he says in Matthew 6, 33, what, John? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all others will be given to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this other stuff will be provided for you. You're, you're not what you want. It may not be what you think you want. But, but if you're need. seeking his righteousness first, then that is what you want. And again, sometimes those bumps in the road are pretty ugly. But the ultimate goal God has in mind is drawing you to him. Satan comes along. He says, you know, if God was any good, he wouldn't let that happen to you. You know, Mo, if God really loved you and your pet, he wouldn't have all this dental problem. He wouldn't have to go to the dentist and have all these teeth pulled out. God must not love dogs. Yeah, that's Satan coming along home saying, trying to put that doubt in your mind to say, you know, that's right. How come God's not taking care of me? How come this happened? And it's Satan trying to say, doubt. Don't believe God. It's like Eve. You know, Satan comes, did God really say you can't eat of all those fruits of the tree and you really die? You're not going to die. You know, that's what Satan does to us. He tries to confuse us and make us do things we shouldn't be doing. He's very so good at it. He's very good at it. He's well trained. And he knows us very well. He knows what tempts me, which may not tempt you at all. You know, it may not bother you one bit. You look at that and think, well, that's stupid. And the same may be true otherwise. Something that tempts Emily, nobody else in the room may have a problem with. Because Satan knows us well enough to know. Because he's watched us. He's observed us. He's seen us respond to different stimuli. He knows what's challenging to us and what isn't. And once you conquer one, he sends another one. Because he's not a very nice guy. And his goal is to ruin our relationship with God. And we need to just be careful that we don't let him do that. So what does Jesus mean when he says we must carry our cross? Okay, follow his word. You know, I've heard be, bear the cross that we, we're supposed to calculate. I think that's right. Yeah. Do what he says. Bear the cross we're supposed to calculate. That's a challenge to being a Christian. It is not all roses. It's tough. Jesus says, if you follow me, you will be persecuted. Now, most of us in this room have never really been persecuted the way they were persecuting Christians in the first century or the way they're persecuting Christians around the world. But if you live for God and speak out against evil, people won't like you sometimes. They won't invite you to the parties. You know, if you tell somebody who's homosexual, you know, God doesn't approve of your lifestyle, they're not going to care for you, probably. They're going to call you a religious bigot. They're going to not want to be around you anymore because you don't approve of what they're doing. And the same is true sometimes of people who are living together. It's, what's wrong with me living with her? We're going to get married. You know, that's the goal, so what's the problem here? They don't want somebody telling them, well, because God doesn't want you doing that. You know, if you want to get married, get married. But don't just do what you want to do. And I think the challenge for us is, do I want to carry the cross? Am I going to model the sacrifice and obedience of Christ that he modeled for us? Am I willing to do what Jesus did? And none of us are going to be able to do 
perfectly what Jesus did. But again, that's the goal. That's my desire. I want to be the best person I can be. I want to live the way God wants me to be. And it's a challenge, you know, that Paul says, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And sometimes we look at our lives and think, well, I may be a Christian, but I'm not going to do that. You know, that, that's just too much work. And that's too much problem. I don't have the time. You know, and Paul makes it clear, Jesus was obedient to God, even to dying on the cross. He didn't want to do that. How do we know he didn't want to do that? He yeah. yeah, he prays in the garden the night before. God, if there's any way in the world not to let this happen, take this cup from me. Don't, you know, pass this out of here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to die. I don't want to hang on a cross. But he ended his prayer by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's the prayer I wish I could always pray. God, here's what I want. Here's what I'd like to have. But you know what's best, and you do that for me. Whatever you do, your will be done, not mine. And I think it's a challenge for us to follow that kind of example. And as Rodwell just said, count that cost. Am I willing to do the kind of life God had Jesus do? Where I'm more concerned about you than I am more comfort. I'm more concerned about helping you get along than I am my easy life. That's what Jesus did. He gave up heaven to come down here and die on the cross for us. And I think that's what he is exactly what he said. Live this way. Do what you're supposed to. You had somebody say, somebody I had some other day, very hot tempered, and just fly off at the drop of a hat. And he said, Well, that's just my cross I have to bear. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, and we use it as, well, that's just my cross I have to bear. I'm not gonna help it, I'm not gonna get over it, I'm not gonna do anything about it. That's just my cross I have to bear. And I say, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. <laughs> I think that may be something you need to work on. Because God says, don't be. That's what we study Sunday morning. Get rid of all the rage, malice, anger. And for Paul to write that does not give any of us the excuse to say, well, I'm just a hot-tempered guy. It's made the way God made me. And you just got to put up with it. Uh, no, I don't think that's what Jesus says. I think he says we need to work on it. And some habits are worse than others. Getting rid of, I mean. You know, some of us have habits. You make them go around the room and ask about them. But we have habits we've, had, we've lived with forever. And we're thinking, hey, I wish I could stop doing that. But we don't. And sometimes we don't because we really want to. We sort of like that habit, whatever it is. And those are the ones that we can say, God, you've got to help me with this. You've got to help me overcome this if it's a bad habit. I can't do it by myself. I cannot do this. I've tried for years, and I just can't quit. And that's when, again, if you're going to pray that, you better be ready for something bad. So if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, and you say, God, just help me. Help me get over there and do whatever's necessary. Just somebody may catch you doing what you're doing. And that's horrible. You know, okay, well, no, I didn't want that. And, but God's thinking, that's what it was going to take. I knew that's what it was going to take. You weren't going to do it otherwise. So you gave me permission, and I had somebody catch you doing what you know you shouldn't have been doing. But those are the challenges, I think, for Christians. I think, rather, that's counting the cost as we move into Christianity. It's God, I don't want to be this. I want to be what you want me to be. Go ahead. So the way that I looked at it, I mean, I think it's the same, the same thing. But when you're in a relationship with somebody, you, you want to do what pleases them. Sure. And and that's how I've looked at I I try to do what I think Jesus would please Jesus. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Um which is sort of I think the same thing that I was saying. I think that's exactly the same thing. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. What's it going to cost you to please me? What are you willing to give up in your life to please me? What are you willing to not do in order to please me? What are you willing to start doing in order to please me? Yeah, I think so. And, and again, the key to this relationship is we've got a God who's perfect. And again, you've just been through a tough time and we look at God thinking, wait a minute, I, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, that's not fair. But we do still have to remember God's primary goal is to save us. And that's his bargain in the relationship. I will save you. 
and sometimes that's not the thing we're thinking about and it hurts and we're thinking I asked him for a miracle I know he it. would have been glorified <laughs> he would have all over the world if we have made sure and he could do that he over and over but for whatever reason that wasn't in his plan but what is in his plan Rosalind is for you to trust him and that whatever's happening to us not just shaky us. right now I know it is and I appreciate that and I think every one of us would be and that's why we pray and that's why the Holy Spirit needs to help us God I'm, I'm struggling right now I don't understand why this happened I don't know why you didn't fix it and God's saying trust me just trust me I've got your soul just trust me and you know I've talked about it you know just I had my soul but he broke my heart I know it but again he didn't break your heart circumstances did I don't believe for a moment God touched his finger down there kahuna. But fuck stop but with him. It, in a sense, it does. But his promise is salvation, not an easy life. And again, if God was going to avoid all kinds of hurt and pain because we're good people, Jesus never would have died on a cross, even though that was his plan. And again, I think that's the thought we said a while ago. God, here's what I want. Don't do this to me. But whatever your will is, I'm willing to take it. And I don't have all the answers. I don't understand why God or allows things to happen in some circumstances and not others. But I do believe I want to trust him to say, whatever's going to happen, he's going to save me. I'm going to hang on to God even when I don't want to, even when it seems horrible. I want to do my best to hang on because I want to go to heaven. I want to see my loved ones that are up there. I want to be with them for eternity. And so I'm not going to give up on God because he's never going to give up on me. He's going to hold me and love me and caress me and let his spirit work in me so that I'll just come back to him. Paul. You know, it's hard to you know, sometimes give up at some point in your life and that you have. And so when you said, I think about it, what, you know, how we're blessed with things God has given us and so on. But we, you know, we've been blessed more than having to give up at some point in our life. In the big scheme of things, if you're going to just keep a total, that's mm -hmm. probably true. I've got many more blessings in my life numerically that I've not had blessings in my life. But sometimes all the blessings aren't the same value. You know, there's some of them that are way up there at the top and I could lose 30 of these and go and lose that one. And I think that's true. And I think sometimes we don't spend enough time thanking God for what we have. You mentioned that. We just take it for granted that everything's going to be okay because I'm a child of God. And if we're not careful, that's how what the hell the lost people preach. Those are the people you're talking about, no? They preach, as long as you believe in Jesus, you're going to get the parking spot right next to the door. As long as you believe in Jesus, you'll get the promotion. If you have enough faith, they always throw that in. So now it's your fault. If it doesn't work out the way you want it to, it's your fault. Those people are lying to us. Jesus never said, God never said, you'd have a life of right. There's a number of opinions. If, if you just trust me, you just believe in me, everything will work the way it's going. We're going to be saying that for the next two or three weeks. But I think that's correct. We need to not believe the lies that say Christians get everything they want in this world. It's not true. That's not the way God works anymore. That was the Old Testament. That was Jewish. You live the way you're supposed to as a Jew. Your crops produced, your cows produced, and everything was the way it's supposed to be. You defeated your enemies. That doesn't work that way anymore in the spiritual kingdom of God. The ultimate victory is our salvation. And that's what we're all hanging on to. We didn't get very far. We <laughs> <laughs> didn't talk too much. We were on the first one for like 30 minutes. To calculate one. I told you. Well, we're still on that one. We're, still on that one. <laughs> we're not out of that one yet. Yeah. Um, you've got a handout for the next first part of Luke. In fact, I guess it's all of Luke 15. That's where we're going after we finish this one. We'll get into Luke 15 and talk about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, you know, the prodigal son story. We all know that story. Uh, we're going to cover those the next three. We'll do that. But not next week or next Monday because we're off next Monday. Go celebrate Fourth of July and shoot off fireworks or whatever you want to do. As long as it's legal wherever you're at. Uh, enjoy the Fourth of July. That's one of the things we need to be thankful for. We live in an awesome nation. I know it's far away from perfect. I can't think of another place in this world I'd want to live. Uh, and some of you have been to a lot of places, and I've been to several. And there's no place like home. 
uh, this nation is still the best one on this earth that I'm aware of. Can you imagine living in Ukraine right now? We were carrying Russia to a missile and landed right in the middle of some shopping center and killed a bunch of people. And just, you know, there are a lot of people that are much more safe than us. If we want to sit around and complain and gripe, go watch the news for a while and realize there's a whole lot of people much worse off than we are. And be thankful this weekend for the nation you live in, for the people who made it possible for us to live here. Because not everybody's got the freedoms we have. Last thoughts? We saw John's email. Hospice has said Mike's probably got about 72 hours to live. And he'll be passing. So keep Mike and Susan, Susan, John and Heather in your prayers. That's where Heather's at tonight. She's still working at home. Keep them in your prayers as they go through the end of this week. And so that works out for the hospice. And so we'll have a pretty clean time. Keep them in your prayers. Pray for everyone. Yeah, I talked to her. Saturday, I guess, she'd fallen that warm. Fortunately, it breaks anything. You know, you, you worry sometimes, I worry sometimes, and you're like, well, if you worry, I'm concerned sometimes <laughs> about people who live by themselves, you know, especially as they get older, like Evelyn does with walking with the cane. She fell in her kitchen. She said she was bending over to clean something or do something and just kept right on going, and she couldn't get up. Uh, she had to call her daughter and son-in-law to come over the house and help her get back up. She didn't break anything, didn't hurt anything, except for Friday. Yeah, she's a little sore, sore, which is understandable. Uh, But we're thankful she didn't get hurt any more than that. But, you know, it's one of those things as we get older, we don't have the mobility and the balance and all that other stuff that we used to have. Some of us can relate to that yet. (laughs) So keep, yeah, keep that in your prayers. Just for her safety, because she does live by herself in that apartment complex. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for providing salvation for us. And God, even as we talk tonight, sometimes it's just not easy for us to trust you and to do what you want us to do. Act like everything's okay. God, so we just pray for your help, for your spirit to work in our lives, to bring us that peace that you promise us, even in the midst of turmoil. So that we can be a witness to others who need to know you too. God, I do pray that you'd be with Chi Chi and Alvis as they're both fighting COVID. I pray that you'd be with Evelyn as she's unstable on her feet. I'm thankful that when she fell Saturday, she didn't get hurt any more than she did, didn't break anything. And I just pray, God, you'd be with her. Help her to have that stability that she needs to get along. And if it turns out, Father, she needs to maybe not be by herself. I just pray you would give her the understanding of that as well so that she would be able to move somewhere else. And God, I do pray for Mike and for Susie and for Heather and for John. Probably the next few days at hospice is right. We're going to be pretty tough. And I just pray for them as well, for your comfort, your peace, and that they feel your presence and know that you're there with them even as they're going through this dark hour. Thank you for the grace you do show us helping us even when we're not helping ourselves because you love us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, everybody. Um, um, yes.